So Friday afternoon, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, categories, comparison, and cases, uh, which are, to me at least, those are sort of like the fundamental tools that we use uh, to structure information about the world, and it enables us to be sort of uh, active agents in the world and effective agents in the world. Uh, a few words about me. My name is Einar Höst. I'm a Norwegian software de developer. I've been working with software for 20 years now in various capacities. I am currently working for the Norwegian Labor, uh, Labor and Welfare Administration, which is uh, a pretty large organization. It administers uh, a third of the national budget in Norway, uh, which is quite a lot of money. Uh, and we use that money to provide various services for the Norwegian public, such as unemployment benefits, sickness benefits, child benefits, uh, pensions, and so on and so forth. Uh, basically, from the moment you are born as a Norwegian citizen and until sort of the inwards happens, later on, uh, we have services in place in case you need them. And then we have categories and conditions in place to determine who qualifies for what kind of service under what circumstances. So that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in categories. So in a sense, this is going to be a talk about category theory, but not in the sort of scary mathematical sense. Uh, it's going to be more uh, from a psychological perspective. It's going to be much closer to the talk that Alvaro just gave. So George Klakov says uh, that there, is, there exists a folk theory of categories, and I think he's right about that. Folk theory in this case means sort of a notion that uh, a lot of people have in their heads about how something works. And it has three sort of uh, parts to it. One is that things come in these well-defined categories. The second is that these categories are characterized by shared properties. And the third is that there is one right taxonomy of the categories. Now, the problem with this folk theory is that these are all wrong. And in a sense, this talk is going to be um, about the details of describing how all these are wrong. And the reason why that's important is that uh, because it's, uh, it's wrong in, a thing, uh, in ways that matter for us when we want to model software systems. Uh, and it's important also because it might be that as software developers, we're trained in thinking about models and different models and so on and so forth. Uh, but we're going to meet a lot of people who are not trained in that way, and they have this folk theory in their mind. Right? This is how they look at the world. Um, we're going to look a lot uh, at category practice. Uh, and, well, so to sort of introduce um, as a way into this, this uh, topic of categories, I wanted to, I needed some, some way in, right? So I, I thought it might be a good idea to, uh, and a polite thing to do to come up with a greeting to you, right? So I start with a hello, which is like, uh, it's a good start for a greeting, right? Um, and then fellow, which is perhaps even better because I'm establishing some sort of um, equality and, and common experience, but then, uh, I sort of wanted to strike a, a dissonant chord, right? Something that feels immediately wrong. Uh, and the reason I want to do that is because I want to talk about categories. And the, uh, in the sense in that this is a, a sort of a dissonant greeting to us, has to do with categories. I could have chosen something a lot more conventional uh, and a lot less interesting from my perspective. I could have said something like, hello, fellow humans, instead. And that sounds almost natural. And something like Mark Zuckerberg could have said to sort of try to blend in with the people. Or I could have gone with hello fellow sentient beings, which would be a little bit quaint, uh, but not as dissonant as, as the one I chose. Uh, and it might have you sus suspecting that I'm some sort of octopus, but I, you wouldn't feel too bad about that. Uh, you couldn't possibly object if I chose something like this, like hello fellow objects. Of course, that would be, uh, because we all know that sort of object is the base class of everything in the world, right? But it would also be sort of a, a, a kind of vague greeting, because I was all, would also be greeting all the chairs in the room. And so it's not very precise. But I chose this one because I found it to be interesting. And why is that? Why is it so interesting? Or why do I find it to be interesting? I don't know about you. Um, is it wrong? Do we agree that we are apes? Well, to answer that question, we sort of had to dig deeper. Like, what does it mean to be an ape? Right? What is this ape category? 
uh, and what characterizes the members of that category? Well, um, from a technical perspective, an ape is a group of animals. It's a clade uh, in the animal kingdom that share a common ancestor. And this approach to sort of classifying animals is known as cladistic. So that's how we do it. And from that perspective, there really is not much debate. We know perfectly well what a human is. That's well defined. We know also what an ape is. And we have this common ancestor with all the other things that we happen to, to categorize as apes and that we have no problem with categorizing as apes. It's just the us that we find problematic to be categorizing as apes. So there is, this is a relationship. And we should sort of... I go to acceptance. This is us now at the family reunion with all our relatives, and we should be enjoying ourselves. And we're sort of all even flanked on the left side by a gibbon, so it's not really easy to sort of sneak out and go somewhere else. So we might as, just, might as well just enjoy the company. And it's not only that, not only are we apes, but we are by far the most common ape in the world. This here is the chimpanzee to human ratio in the world by the most optimistic uh, estimate for the number of chimpanzees, which is 30, 000, uh, 300,000, rather. And for each one of those chimpanzees, there are 26,000 of us. And that means if you gather together all the apes in the world and you pick one at random, chances are you'll pick a human almost every time. So that's us. Uh, from this perspective, a human now is just a hominid in the category of simians, and there should be no problems. But there is a problem, right? There is something that is, it still feels dissonant. And the problem, I think, has to do with typicality. Even though we are a very common ape, we don't feel like a typical ape. And this is kind of strange, and it's kind of unusual even, uh, because usually commonality influences uh, typicality. So if there is a very common member of a category, we tend to think of it as typical. Uh, but it's not entirely unique. We have the same situation for birds. Uh, the most common bird in the world is the chicken, which is kind of a pathetic bird, right? <laughs> He can't even fly properly. Uh, but of course, the reason why there are so many chickens has to do with the fact that there are so many humans, right? because we raise chickens so we can eat them. So we sort of broke the, the, the bird category. Uh, this is unfortunate. Uh, but OK, so we grudgingly sort of accept the evidence since Darwin and since we are sort of uh, these um, uh, smart people, enlightened people who know about Darwin and so on and so forth. We know uh, that we are technically apes, but we don't like it much, right? So we don't think of ourselves as apes usually. We feel primarily human. And we, we, can, we have a line of defense for this. We can sort of line of reasons and evidence why we are not really apes, why we are really human. Well, for one thing, we are not hairy enough. Right? So we have some bodily hair, but not nearly as much as, as those other apes. We walk too much upright. Right? We walk on two feet, whereas all the apes that I know of walk on all fours. Our arms aren't long enough. And we have weak foot grip, and this has to do with walking upright. We are poor climbers. Many of us are afraid of heights. It's very hard to envision an orangutan that's being afraid of heights. That would be very limiting for the lifestyle. <laughs> and of course, and this is perhaps the most important one, we consider ourselves to be much too intelligent to be a mere ape. Right? So we even labeled ourselves as the wise one. Right? or the interpreting one, uh, to use Alvaro's phrase. Um, and there's also this, I guess, so, so we are not quite fond enough of bananas. Most of us enjoy a banana. Uh, few of us enjoy two. No one is three in a row. Um, but I can easily sort of imagine in my head a chimpanzee sort of chain-eating bananas all day. That, that's basically what I think that chimpanzees do, actually. Which turns out to be wrong because, well, it's actually true that bananas uh, distinguish humans from apes, but not in the, in the, in the way that we're uh, accustomed to thinking. Um, when we talk about bananas, we, we tend to think about these things, which are the fruits, or rather the berry of the Cavendish banana tree. Um, these cannot reproduce. They have no seeds, so we clone them. So it's an interesting category in that sense that all the Cavendish bananas are really, really similar. The only way an ape can get to one of these is through us. So we are sort of the banana dealers of the ape world. 
so we have to sort of back back down on that one, but but we still have a lot of evidence, and we feel different. And and Wittgenstein agrees, and he is a very very clever ape, right? So we should listen to him. He agrees in the sense that what matters for the meaning of a word is how we use it, right? And we rarely use ape to to mean us, right? And if we do that, we do it to insult someone, right? So we, we do that if we uh, characterize someone, a human, as an ape, that's an insult, it's a slur. It's an act of violence, even. But usually, uh, we don't, right? Good people don't do that. So that has us thinking that it seems to be another notion of ape here that excludes these human apes which is how we tend to use it. Now, this is kind of confusing, but now, because now we're in this situation, we don't really know if we're apes or not anymore. But it shouldn't be confusing, at least not to people attending DDD Europe, because what we have here are two different contexts, and ape is really just a homonym that identifies two distinct categories. But still, we are confused, and, and uh, at least people in general are confused, and probably some of us as well, uh, because it's, we don't really have this distinction in our mind clearly all the time. Also, um, when we have a technical category like that and one that's sort of everyday, casual category, we rank them in importance and we somehow feel that the technical category is more, has more, is, is, the, is more like the truth than the other one, which doesn't really make much sense, but, but, but that's how we think. But still, uh, we might still wonder, because there is no denying, at least from, from the evidence that we've seen, um, there is no denying that we have this common ancestor. So there should be some sort of uh, family resemblance between us and the other apes. And one of my favorite examples is this. Now, at the end of this talk, if everything goes well, everything goes well and you're a polite audience, you might clap. And that seems to me to be an extremely ape-like behavior, like to, to, to clash your hands together to make noise. And it's true, other apes do that as well. They clap also. They do it for slightly different reasons, though. So uh, other apes will, will clap their hands to warn of immediate danger. Uh, whereas, since we are sort of sophisticated uh, social animals, we have invented a group behavior of applause. So we are the only ape that has invented the applause as sort of the group's recognition of the individual. So this, to me, then sort of nicely captures this dual nature that we have, this apeness and this humanness. So this is our, our human apeness uh, leading us uh, to invent the applause. OK, so this was my introduction. Um, <laughs> I hope you're excited to hear more about categories. Um, I'm going to dig into it a little bit deeper. Um, by asking this sort of fundamental question, now what is a category? And I don't mean that, um, I don't mean that in this sort of, uh, what is it really, right? What is the true nature of categories? Um, to me, that's sort of like discussing the nature of celestial beings. There is, there is nothing uh, indicating even that there is, there is such a thing as true nature. So I want to, uh, well, that's sort of an impractical perspective then, so I want to look at practical perspectives and what categories are. For instance, one practical consideration, an interesting question, is how is your category represented in the human brain? And this is something that people have actually looked at. And the short, first of the short answer is that we don't know. But we have some models, and models are great because we can test them and we can sort of compare them with empirical results, and we can see which models explain what phenomena. Um, for a very long time, we had only one model, and we didn't really even identify it much as such, because it was sort of implied. And this is called the classical view, um, sort of a classical view, I guess, in Western thought at least, and it, it's uh, tightly close to the notion of classical sets and of classical logic. Right? And this is uh, the idea that categories are constituted by essential properties. So basically, if you have a category, you can list the essential properties, the necessary and sufficient properties that you need to be a member of that category, and then you're done. And it's very easy to determine whether or not you're a member of that category. So there's a crisp boundary, if you like, around the category. So either you're in or you're out. 
And it's very nice because once you've determined if you're in or out, it doesn't really matter. You can treat it entirely mathematically from, no, uh, from then on, right? So you can make logical deductions using classical logic. Very powerful stuff. So the only problem with this model is that it doesn't really hold up to much scrutiny. It doesn't seem to be that's the way properties work. But, but we believe that it was correct for, well, at least since Aristotle and up until like 1970. And in 1970, um, there's a researcher called Eleanor Roche uh, who had this intuition that this just doesn't really sound right. And she was researching um, the categories of colors and she found that when we sort of try to categorize something as, as red, it turns out that there are sort of degrees of being red, right? So something is obviously red, something is quite red-like, and then at some point it's going to be difficult to decide. And so she came up with an alternative model which is known as the prototype model. And the prototype model means that you have some sort of ideal member of the category, and when you, when you want to determine if something belongs to that category or not, you compare it to the ideal. Right? And that means that if, if, if it's very similar to the ideal, then you're going to say, yeah, I think it belongs to the category. And if it's very different from the ideal, you're going to say, no, it's not part of the category. But then there are some interesting things happening sort of as you go further and further away from the prototype. Right? And at some point, you're going to say, well, I don't really know anymore. This is difficult. And if you ask a group of people, some percentage is going to say yes, some percentage is going to say no. So it appears that there is a gradient to this uh, category membership. And this causes all kinds of problems because it's, you can no longer use uh, simple classical logic to make deductions. But it seems to explain uh, how we categorize things better. Another practical perspective is what are categories used for? Why are they useful? Why do we, why do we need them? Well, we need them for sense making. They are how we organize and structure information about the world. And we go through sort of this process all the time, constantly, uh, not even consciously, but we go like, this is like that, and this is identical to that, and this is roughly the same as that, so I can treat it the same. Well, this is obviously different from that, so I'm going to have to do something different over here. So we have this process of comparison and sorting and classification and distinguishing that goes on all the time inside our, our, our magnificent brains. And this is what enables language. We need to be able to create these aggregates, these groups of things that we can talk about under the same label. It would be very, very cumbersome to create a language where, where every object and every phenomenon had its own name. It was like labeling everything with GUIDs. You can't really say anything interesting then. So we need to be able to aggregate. Uh, it allows economy of thought. So you can think about large numbers of objects at the same time. Uh, makes for much more efficient thought. Makes for efficient communication. I can make like sweeping statements like all dogs are good. And it provides a lot of information, right? Very efficient. And it enables uh, induction also. So if I, if I observe a cat and I see that it sort of deliberately seems to be pushing a glass of water off of a table, I can sort of conclude that well, there's, if there's another situation with a cat and a glass of water, I better watch out, right? And this enables induction and it enables learning. So it's super important. It enables navigation, choice, planning, meaningful action, all the good stuff that enables us to be effective agents in the world. Uh, and now I'd like to look a little bit at some examples of categorization in practice. And the short story is that categorization in practice is hilarious. It's really funny. Uh, that's, that's why I spent so much time talking about it, because I think it's, it's very fascinating. And I want to start with this sort of everyday casual modeling that I'm sort of hinting at with this uh, continuous process of sorting things. That process is very coarse. It's imprecise. It's partial. It doesn't have to be like, perfect all the time. But it's also mostly adequate. And it's very, very, very useful. So we would be sort of helpless without it. And we use them to achieve goals. Now, um, I really like this quote by Rebecca uh, that says that the longer you investigate something, the less coherent it becomes. And it's really like, uh, I lifted this quote sort of out of context, I think. Uh, and you should never do that with quotes. But I think it applies nicely to the, to the, the topic at hand with this, this, these categories. And the longer we look at the process we go through, and 
not to mention the accuracy with, uh, of our categorization, it, it sort of falls apart. But that's okay, because we observe that it's very useful. So let's, let's now look a little bit deeper at this notion of category membership and the process that we go through to evaluate membership to, de to determine whether or not something is a member of a category. Now, I was talking about this classical view that talks about necessary and sufficient properties. If you have that view, then this, uh, then this membership evaluation is just a predicate, right? You just evaluate and you're done and you have yes or no. So it's, it's very nice to establish this ISA relationship. Whereas in the alternative model proposed by Eleanor Roche, it's more like a gradient or a rating, right? I can say, yeah, this is, this is entirely like that category, or this is not at all like this category, and this is somewhere in the middle. So I'd, I'd like to look at a few examples. And sometimes, and perhaps most times, this is very easy, and we, we do it very successfully, right? So this is my example, this, this fine beast. Is this a horse? Well, I'm going to say that the hoarseness in this case is very, very high. Right? With high confidence, I can say, yes, I believe this to be a horse. What about this one? Well, the hoarseness is a lot lower in this case, right? I would, if I were to point that, if I was a child and I was to point at this and say, horse! Uh, my parents would correct me, and they'd say, no, it's not really a horse, right? It's not really a horse. But it's not entirely unhorse-like either, because at least it's a mammal, right? So that makes it much more horse-like than most objects in the world. What about this one? Even lower hoarseness, but it still has four legs. So it still has some shared properties, I guess. At this point, sort of, okay, uh, let, let's, let's stop playing the game. Uh, the hoarseness here is, is practically zero. I can say with very high confidence that this isn't a horse. Well, my, my confidence is high for these ones as well, right? Um, but sometimes it could be a little bit harder. What about this one? Is this a horse? It looks quite a bit like the horse or the thing that we saw before, the animal that we saw before. I'm going to give it a rating of like medium plus hoarseness. And, but I was also thinking that why is it medium plus? Why is it actually high? Because it looks a lot like a horse. And to me, I'm not a horse expert in any way. This could, might, it wouldn't make much difference to me whether or not this is a horse, right? So it, it has a lot of horse-like behaviors. And it turns out that the hoarseness depends on the ex, uh, existence and absence of other categories, right? And this, this uh, ties into what uh, Alvaro was talking about, about knowledge about the world, right? So categories don't exist in a vacuum. They depend on each other. So in a sense, it's the donkeyness now is that it's sabotaging for the hoarseness of the donkey, <laughs> right? Without this troublesome category of donkeys, I would be very happy to classify this as a horse. And it, it, it wouldn't really be a problem. So it matters a lot what categories are available to us. And then, by the way, this, this sort of matters a lot if you're doing programming as well, right? So do you have donkeys? Do, do, do you not have donkeys? Um, well, yeah. I think at I don't know if you can see this, uh, so red on, on, on black. This is a tomato, and you have to include it, uh, uh, some uh, example of tomatoes at uh, DDD conferences, I think. It's become sort of a fashion. And the reason is that, well, it's so hard to classify. It's so hard to determine, is this a fruit or is it a vegetable? Uh, but I think we're making it a lot more difficult than it needs to be. So in my head, if you ask me if, if a tomato is a fruit or a vegetable, I'm going to answer like, well, it's like roughly 70% vegetable and 30% fruit. And this is good enough for me. I, I can live nicely in the world and believing that this is true. I don't really need to make a choice. But I think we're trained by this, uh, I think we're trained by the folk theory of uh, categorization, really, to believe that things need to fit in one category. And we're also trained to think that, well, fruit and vegetable, there are separate things, so it has to belong in one or the other of the categories. 
Whereas it's, it's much more like this, like it's like Schrodinger's tomato in a sense, right? So outside, in the generic case, outside a given context, you don't really know what it is. And it doesn't really matter, right? It's only when you want to use a tomato that it matters w well, what, what kind of thing it is. And of course, Rimo has this, this nice quote that says that, okay, if you're making food, it's a vegetable. If, you, if you're a botanist, it's a fruit. So it's, this is one of those technical categories again, right? It's technically a fruit. And if you're doing theater, uh, it's feedback. And it sort of struck me as I was making this talk that the theater context probably also covers conference talks. <laughs> so now you, have, now you have, at the end of this talk, you have sort of a choice. Now you can clap your hands, you can throw a tomato. And then you can sort of work out for yourself which one of those you think is more, more, more ape-like, right? Okay, the point here is not that a tomato is this or that, but that ca uh, categories are contextual and they can be fuzzy. So they can have these degrees of membership. And yeah, so some, some more examples. This is the game of chess. And if you ask a group of people whether or not chess is a sport, this is one of the classics, right? People get heated debates of whether or not chess is a sport. On average, people are gonna say, yeah, it's a sport that is also a game. And they're also going to say, on average, no, it's not a sport. So it's both a sport that is also a game and not a sport. And this, again, this, uh, it, this sounds ridiculous, right? It doesn't really add up. But it doesn't really matter. It's fine to have these inconsistent uh, evaluations of categories in our heads. And I was talking a little bit about the relationships between different kinds of categories when I was talking about donkeys and horses. And we like, uh, we like things to be tidy and neat, so we want to create taxonomies of things that we find in the world. And in particular, we want to structure things in hierarchies. Um, there has been done research on, the, on this as well, and it turns out there is very little evidence that inside our heads we actually represent what we think to constitute hierarchies act as actual hierarchical structures in our brain. There is, there is little uh, evidence to support that, but we still find them to be immensely useful. But we sort of have to recreate them, probably. We have to sort of uh, construct them um, in our heads. We have to remember every time that this is really a hierarchy of things. And this, now this starts to feel a lot like software development and, and familiar ground. We like to work in terms of generalizations and specializations. We like to organize things that way because it, it has a lot of explanatory power. Right, so we want, but this is in a uh, structure that we impose on the world. So we've been talking li a little bit about the categorization of animals. This is sort of um, uh, the scheme that is currently in place for doing that uh, exercise. But we shouldn't take this too seriously. This is just a model. Right, this is imposed structure. There is nothing uh, inevitable about this structure. In fact, we've had many models for classification of animals before this. We are going to have something that is going to replace this at some point when enough people, enough uh, people doing research, um, agree that it would be better to organize it in some other way. And in fact, when I was Googling for animal classification, Google also helpfully said that. In addition to this, people also ask, what are the seven classifications of animal? What are the five classifications of animal? What are the 10 classifications of animal? What are the six major classifications of animal? What are the 11 groups of animals? And what are the seven characteristics of animals? So, so we shouldn't take our models too seriously. It's just imposed structure that we uh, use uh, because we find it to be useful. Now, what's interesting, what's more interesting to me than these concrete hierarchies that we construct is that in a hierarchy, um, we tend to identify, or there tends to be something called the basic level category, which is the one we prefer to use when we categorize and think about things. And this is unconscious, we're not really aware of it, but we have our favorite sort of spot in the hierarchy that we use more often. So we have this basic level preference. And that means that if I see a dog running towards me, I'm going to say, well, that's a dog, right? Because dog is the basic level category uh, for me. I'm not going to say, wow, it's a German Shepherd, or ooh, it's a poodle. I'm going to think, it's a dog. That's, that's going to strike first. It might be that I'm, oh, well, it's so technically a German Shepherd now coming towards me, but um, I'm going to think dog first. This is what's known as basic level preference. 
the way that we come up with this, it's not something that we deliberately do, but it works through a mechanism of difference and information. Information means that we want categories that provide a lot of information about the members in the category. Now, if I say that something is a dog, that conveys a whole lot of information. Um, similarly, if I say that something is a bird, that also conveys a lot of information. Of course, if I say that something is a German Shepherd or a Poodle, that conveys even more information. But the problem is that Poodles and German Shepherds are not that different. So we want a higher degree of, of difference between the different kinds of basic level categories. So it's more useful to, um, to sort of identify, well, we have birds and we have cats and we have dogs, and not have all these other um, categories uh, that we use um, for sort of the fastest level of categorization that we use. And it, again, it's not deliberate, it just happens. That's sort of how our brains work. It makes sure that we don't do harder work than, than we need to. This is automatic, but it is also, it's not sort of generic. You don't find it, uh, uh, it's not identical throughout the world. It's based on utility and experience. It depends on your expertise. So if you're sort of, if you raise dogs for a living, it might be that your basic level uh, categorization is pushed down. So maybe for you then, you actually think first, well, it's a poodle immediately before you think it's a dog. It's also culture specific. Uh, for an urban dweller like me, um, my sort of nature categories are very coarse. So I'm just thinking bird, dog, tree. I, I rarely, uh, I don't uh, immediately think, well, that's not just a tree, that's, that's a maple, that's an oak, that's a pine. Uh, but if my livelihood depended on my intimate knowledge of this, it might be again that, that my classification would be pushed down. So when I was walking uh, from, the, from the hotel to the venue, uh, I discovered this beautiful tree, but I, I, I have nothing more to say about that. It's a beautiful tree. Um, but, okay, so that's basic level preference. But it turns out, it's always, when you look at categories, it's, almost, it's always more complicated than it seems at first hand. So I want, actually, at this point, to run a little experiment. And I need your participation for this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you images of two things. And I want immediate reactions. I want immediate categorization. I want like sub-second responses. Shout it out. I don't want you to be thinking. I know you can do this because we are, like, we are excellent at this. Right? We have this pattern matching skills and immediate categorization which has helped us thrive in the world. So I'm going to show you two pictures, but I want to run a little test run first, just to show that, well, you actually <laughs> do participate. So I'm going to show you now an image. I'm going to do a little countdown, and I want you to shout. Horse. Yes, it's a horse. Perfect. Um, you passed the test. Now we can run the experiment. So let's run the experiment now. Here comes two pictures. First picture now. Three, two, one, and bird. yes, it's a bird. Perfect. Let's try picture two. Another countdown. Yes, very good. Bird and penguin. <laughs> what happened? Well, first of all, what happened was what was supposed to happen, what I hoped was going to happen. I have never tried this before. Um, so, so thank you for sort of confirming the theory in this case. Well, we agree, I hope, that robins and penguins are both birds, right? We know this. But in a sense, a robin is a bird that happens to be a robin. <laughs> Whereas a penguin is just a penguin that happens to be a bird. And what I mean by that is a convoluted way of saying that robins are typical birds, whereas penguins are atypical birds. And this matters because experiments have shown, including this one, that typical cases are categorized at the basic level, whereas atypical cases are categorized at the subordinate level. And this has practical implications as well. If we learned that, that a robin is susceptible to a certain kind of disease, we are more likely to generalize and say, that probably affects all birds. But if you hear that a penguin can catch a certain disease, we might think that that's probably a penguin-specific thing. 
Right? So we don't generalize so easily from the atypical cases. Now I want to, t well, so saying this, this is really, to me at least, it's a lot of fun. Um, trouble in taxonomy town. So I want to talk about non-transitivity. So one of the nice properties that you have in the classical theory of categorization is that you have transitivity between categories. So if category A is a member of category B, and you have an instant relationship between category B and category C, well then it, well, whoa, what just happened? Oh, it's back. Thanks. Um, then you also have an is a relationship from A to C. Whereas non-transitivity means that this doesn't hold. This here is a chair. If you ask people, again, on average, are chairs furniture? They're going to overwhelmingly say, yes, chairs are furniture. If you ask people, if car seats are chair, they might answer a little more slowly. We're going to say, on average, yes, car seats are kind of chairs. Now, if you ask them, are car seats furniture? They're going to say, no, they're not. So we have, is not a relationship here. So this is now, we have practical demonstration for non-transitivity between categories, which makes them more interesting and, and, and harder to work with. Um, the point, again, is that categories are fuzzy. Now, if we're going to rate how chair-like our car sits, that's not going to be 100%, right? So it's going to be a lower number. And that's sort of where we have some of these problems. And there are degrees of membership. There are these edge cases that we need to handle. And the edge cases are sort of the rebels in the category world. Right? They, don't, they don't want to belong. And because we have these fuzzy categories, the fuzzy boundaries and the edge cases, we find ourselves in situations where we enter negotiations uh, about what belongs and what doesn't belong. It might be that we don't agree. And I wanted sort of an illustration for negotiation, and I googled for negotiation, but all I got was like people shaking hands, and that's not what negotiation is like. So I, I found this to be more appropriate or more, more illustrating for the process. Um, if you go online, and you shouldn't, uh, you, you will every day uh, find this discussion. Right? Is HTML a programming language? It seems to be a matter of great import to us to resolve this dilemma. And my argument is, uh, this is just like a tomato. We don't really need to know. Uh, but more importantly, is that it's the wrong question. The right question is, do we want HTML to be a programming language or not? And some people want that, and some people don't. Right? So uh, there's a difference of opinion. Um, the problem is that we tend to confuse with sort of descript uh, descript descriptive notions with normative notions. And typically, what we really want to say that when we say something like, no, HTML is not a programming, not a real programming language, that's a normative statement. But we want to sort of disguise it as a descriptive one, right? We want to sort of point to the real world or the true nature of programming languages and exclude the HTML. And the problem, again, is not uh, the object, but what we want the, cat the category or what we want it to be. Now, of course, uh, we shouldn't be too naive about this. Uh, these categories discussions are often proxy discussions for something else. Because what constitutes a programming language also indirectly uh, determine what constitutes a programmer. Right? And it might be that we don't, well, people who work in these real, well, non-HTML programming languages don't want to share the privileges of being a programmer with those people who work with HTML and CSS. And that can be practical things such as salary, recognition, stuff like that. It could be sort of an act of gatekeeping now uh, to keep those people out of the category of programmers. And then we pretend that it's about programming languages. Well, OK. Um, so it's a proxy discussion. And it shows that the power to define what a category is gives you power over the domain. Right? So the question 
isn't when you ask something like is X a member of Y, the real question you should be asking is what are the implications of including X in Y? And why do we want to do it? Why don't we want to do it? Right? And there might be pros and cons to doing this. There might be trade-offs involved. And this brings us to modeling, which is, uh, well, obvious importance to, uh, to us uh, software developers. And I'm going to look at modeling as sort of a technification of categories. And I don't think te technification is a word, uh, but it means to illustrate some, some process from these everyday, casual, fuzzy, ambiguous categories to something more, more technified and precise and with less ambiguity and clearer boundaries. So when we want uh, to create software systems, we often want to eliminate this ambiguity. And this ambiguity actually does great work for our everyday uh, categories. It allows us to have a relatively small number of categories uh, that contain a lot of stuff, uh, that allows us to make powerful statements about the world. But for, for software uh, products, when we want to make software, uh, we typically want less of this ambiguity, and we need to sort of find some way of dealing with, it, with these edge cases. And apparently in biology, there are two kinds of people. There are uh, sort of the splitters and the lumpers, right? There are those who want to have a lot of fine-grained categories, because that gives you clearer boundaries and less ambiguity. And then you have the lumpers who prefer to have larger categories um, and then deal with the sort of edge, edge cases within that. That has the benefit of being easier to work with. Now, the technification of categories ha can have some surprising consequences. I mean, we've seen some of them, um, and there are a lot more. Right? So when I was researching this, well, it turns out that fruits are really nuts. <sighs> Almonds are not nuts. It seems that we're wrong about everything. It's all lies. Right? But we're not really wrong. It has to do with context. So I'm going to keep referring to nuts as nuts. I'm going to insist that nuts are not fruits. I'm going to say almonds, yeah, that, those are nuts. Because I don't, I'm not uh, a biologist. I don't work in that context. I live in sort of the everyday world. And in that case, um, uh, the categories that we have work just fine. So there is this distinction now between these everyday and technical categories. And we want technical categories for precision. But this precision, of course, then comes at a cost. Uh, I was talking about uh, lumpers or, or splitters. Um, I just wanted to mention briefly some of the categories that we have at the Norwegian Labor and um, uh, Welfare Administration. Um, so for us, a lot of those categories actually come from law texts, right? So that's, that's how so it's determined by law who qualifies for what services, under what conditions. So I'm going to call this variations on the theme, and the theme is going to be unmarried people who live together. So, so here are some of the variations over that theme. Uh, two people over 18 years of age who are not married, registered partner, or living with anyone else. Two people who usually live together, even if they are temporarily separated. Two people living in the same house, even if they live in separate parts of the house, unless they each live in separate units in a house with four or more independent and clearly separated units. Two people who have previously been married, two people who are living together in a marriage-like relationship, who could legally get married or enter partnership, who have or are expecting children together, who have or have had children together, who live in a joint residence, who live in a joint com uh, common household, who have lived together for at least 12 months, who have lived together for 12 of the last 18 months, who intend to keep living together. <laughs> so, Precision comes at a cost. Um, in this case, the cost is sort of an explosion of similar categories with a lot of overlap. And I, I guess you could make an argument that Norwegian law needs to be simplified. And it might be that you're right, and it might be that you're wrong. Because again, these, this is just about cho choosing, right? The point is not that uh, one way of sort of partitioning the world is correct and another is wrong. It's that we need to make choices. They're not right or wrong, they have consequences. And of course, as modelers, we know this. Right? We need to make decisions. But when we make decisions, we always do that at the backdrop of sort of an implicit model of the world. 
some implicit opinions about what matters and what doesn't, some tacit assumptions about how things work. Now, these tacit assumptions, because they happen in time, they're always bets against the future. You can always be surprised by the future. And the future is going to sort of push those assumptions towards invalidity, right? To, to, towards being obsolete and towards being no longer rele relevant because the context has changed and so your assumption might be wrong. And this means that we should worry or think about the compo composability of assumptions and decisions and also how many assumptions and decisions that we make all the time, right? Because these assumptions and decisions accumulate over time. Uh, this is a Norwegian athlete. Um, he is competing in an exercise known as gravity. And it, the way that it works is that for each lap, he is walking these laps, and for each lap he picks up a bag of sand. So you can, you can all, on these laps, you can almost call them like little sprints, right? So he's making, uh, taking a little extra bag. And this is, this is uh, similar to how it works when we're do developing software. So we're accumulating all these assumptions over time. We often call it technical debt. But I think it's, it's often more just about these assumptions that we've made. It's like the inevitable byproduct of change on the one hand and inertia on the other. Right? So decisions that we made and the structures that we built based on those assumptions, that is the inertia that we have to deal with. And we create more of it every day. So we should think about change impact. So often, as software developers, you will find yourself asked questions like this, and maybe you ask them yourself, uh, how long is it going to take to implement a feature like this? Well, to answer that, we need to consider, well, how does this feature change our mental model? How many assumptions have just been invalidated by the requirement to make this new feature? How many decisions have you made that must be undone and remade to a larger or smaller degree? How much structure have we built, have we heaped on that are relying on these invalidated assumptions? How much structure is relying on these decisions that we now have to undo? And we tend to, as software developers, we tend to be mostly preoccupied with the technical structure. But there is also the organizational structure that can depend on how we use to view the problem, right? And there are more structures. There is the psychological structure inside the head of every single person in the organization. They have this view of what really matters in the domain, right? And that might be invalidated by the business going in a different direction. And this is also a structure that needs to sort of go along with the ride. And there are rules and regulations. They can be, well, they can rely on assumptions that are happening outside your organization, but that can be even harder to change. And there might be economic structures, how, how your organization, how your software development effort is being financed. And all of these are not independent of each other. They are intertwined in these mutually reinforcing structures. And this very easily leads to entrenchment and ossification. Things become like glued together and hard to change, right? because they, they reinforce, uh, reinforce each other. So I've been looking for different metaphors to illustrate this. Um, the poor athlete who's, who's gathering all these sacks of sand was one. Uh, another one is Tetris, right? So you, you make an assumption, you have some indecision, you generalize a little bit, you have some ambiguity in your mental model, you have some misunderstandings in the organization, you have some conflicts, and then at some point you've sort of lost all your degrees of freedom and you can no longer move forward eff effectively. So it's game over in a sense. Now, since we have this tendency built in in the process of how we make software, uh, an interesting question is, can, uh, are we able to slow it down? Is it possible to slow it down? Can we even reverse it, perhaps? Can we win this game? Is it possible to win a Tetris? And I think we can play successfully for a long time, and longer, perhaps, than we often do. And I think that modeling is our best bet of doing that. When I talk about modeling, I mean this deliberate design of our technical categories. Right? Of course, the, the, the sad part of it is that modeling is very difficult. And it's difficult because it's, well, it's difficult in and of itself, but it's also difficult because it's, 
it feels um, strange to a lot of people to be doing this sort of meta programming of how we view the world. And a lot of people are not accustomed to doing that because they are used to this sort of, uh, and they don't even perhaps see the point because they're used to this folk theory of categories, right? That everything has a neat place in this world. There is a right answer to things, right? So we, this, this notion of modeling can be very foreign. And it's, it's easy to sort of lose sight of that when you're at the conference like DDD Europe, where everyone is sort of, well, yeah, modeling is the way to go, right? We're going to meet people who are not accustomed to modeling, and you're going to have to work with them uh, to counter some of the effects of not doing good modeling. But you're going to meet, you're going to cause discomfort, and you're going to meet reluctance, and people are going to say stuff like, why are you making it so complicated? When you say, we need to consider different models for doing this, we need to revise our model. And of course, the real answer to that is the reason we need to make it complicated to, is to avoid making it unnecessarily complicated over time. When I say, why are you making it so, so complicated, I'm not saying we need a complicated model. It's the process of modeling itself that is being perceived as being complicated. It's not that we need this huge, humongous, super complicated view of the world. It's rather that it's hard work and it feels hard and difficult and it feels complicated then uh, to go through that process. So that's where the resistance comes from, I think. Good thing is I think that modeling is teachable and at one one of the things we can do is, is learn more about categories and to sort of try to debunk this uh, folk theory of categorization that is wrong in, in many different ways and it affects our lives as, as software developers. I'd like uh, to re recommend a few books if you're interested in, in, in reading more about uh, categories. One is The Big Book of Concepts by Gregory Murphy. Um, another is Women, Fire and Dangerous Things by George Lakoff. Uh, what categories reveal about the mind. Um, this apparently is a category in, in, in some culture. I forget which one, uh, unfortunately. Um, it's very interesting. Um, and also, if you, can get your, if you can get your hands on some papers by Eleanor Roche, do read those also. Basically, a lot of the content in these books are based on Eleanor Roche's research. And this is basically the end of the talk. I'm going to leave you with this one. Bees are officially a type of fish. Uh, I hope by now that re your reaction to this is not just that, well, this is absurd. This, doesn't, this isn't correct. It doesn't match the technical uh, categorization of bees. But rather that there must be an interesting context where, this, where, where we want this to be true. Right? And that's it. And I, well, now you're free to throw tomatoes. Or, or, or do what you want. Thank you. <laughs>